Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We would like to welcome you to the Bible study of the Zion Gate Missionary Baptist Church of Kankakee, Illinois. We thank God for you choosing to tune in with us and to share this time of blessing and share this time of the Word of God. I'm Reverend Ronald Bartlett and I'm the senior pastor and I'm going to be conducting an in-depth Bible study of the Book of Romans. Now, by means of some background, we're basically picking up where we left off back in February when we were forced to close down all in-person gatherings. For the sake of any new people that are just now signing on to this or just now trying to get kept caught up, we actually intend on going back and recreating some of those early lessons that we had already covered because where we're at right now we were essentially seven weeks into our program to try and you know get moving when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. So for the sake of continuity we're going to try and go back recreate many of those early Bible studies and then get them posted at a future date. Please be patient with us as we try to navigate a brand new world, new circumstances and new situations, but in spite of how new these circumstances are, we're still teaching the same timeless truths that are found in the Word of God. As I said, we started the study back in January and in-house we had equipped everybody with an outline that we had distributed that dealt with all of the main points of this study. We are going to try and also make that Bible study booklet available to everybody. We would ask that if you are new to the study and you want to get a copy of the outline that we're working with, please email us at ZionGateMBC at gmail.com. Again, ZionGateMBC, all one word, at gmail.com. Give us a little bit of time to work out all of the logistics but we're going to mail those out at no cost to anyone. We're not going to you know, charge you for postage or handling or anything of that sort because our concern is to try and help people learn and study the Bible, learn the Word of God. The outline that we're using is based heavily upon the Analytical Bible Expositor. It is a book, a resource that is written by a man by the name of John Butler. And as far as preachers and pastors are concerned, this is an excellent resource. It is marvelous, especially those that desire a well-organized, alliterated model to work from. I have used it in the past for several other books that we have studied, and I use it because it is good. There is no reason to try and reinvent the wheel just to try and put your name on something. Somebody else has already done the heavy lifting and I give him all the credit for it. And we use that outline as our basic model that we're trying to work from. So if you are interested, please again hit us at our email address and we will get those out to you as quickly as possible. Amen. Now. By some means of brief background to where we've been going, what we've been dealing with, the Epistle to the Romans is written by the Apostle Paul. It is one of the most famous books of the New Testament. It is one of the most complete books that you could possibly study from next to the four Gospels. Paul is writing to the Christian community which was at the city of Rome. He did not organize that church, he did not found that church, but he was an apostle to the church to try and deal with some of the issues of a growing population, of a growing congregation, of a growing church. And he's dealing with a lot of specific problems, but one of the overall problems that he's dealing with with this church is you have two opposing groups of people who are different camps on the issue of salvation. and trying to get them on the same page dealing with issues of the kingdom. The two particular issues that he's dealing with are Gentiles and Jews and they did not agree with each other on a lot of different issues and their opposition to one another is one of the overall themes that the Apostle Paul is addressing throughout this entire book. Where we're at right now we're at lesson number seven. Lesson 7 deals with parity 
in judgment. Unlike worldly judges who are swayed and influenced by different factors, different biases, different personal issues, the judgment of God is fair. The process is not flawed like it is in a human court, in our, even in our Supreme Court within the United States. Every person, regardless of background, creed, or color, is treated the same in the eyes of God. Now, where we pick up our lesson is we're in Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse 11, going through verse 16. For there is no partiality with God. And again, maybe I should say, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Verse 12, For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Amen. Point number one in our outline. The communicating of parody. Parody is a word which essentially means all things are equal. We talk about parity sometimes in, in when we start talking about sports teams, when we start talking about sports leagues, the idea that any given team, any NBA team, should be able to beat another team on any given night. The teams are well matched. They are basically player for player. They match up well. If you have a team structure that is extremely lopsided, you don't have parity. You have powerhouse teams that generally will run over other teams. But the idea of parity means everything is equal. So the principle of parity is laid out in Romans chapter 2 verse number 11 where it says clearly there is no respect of persons with God. The principle basically says that all people are treated the same when it comes to sin, responsibility, and judgment. This is a direct contradiction to the ways of the world. God does not show favorites. Whatever your political affiliation, whatever money you have, whatever person you know, the fact that you can drop somebody's name does not tip the scales in your favor in the presence of God. Now this should also make us think that if the God of Scripture does not show favorites, it should also underline the idea that God does not support racial prejudice, societal prejudice. God made all people equal, regardless of your color, regardless of your income, regardless of your status. God is the creator of all people. He is the creator of all races. And that means all people are equal in the eyes and in the presence of the Lord. That means our present atmosphere that we're dealing with of racial strife, division, increased violence. God does not favor white over black, American over Chinese, Christian over Jew. We are all one people in the presence of the Lord. That one line right there takes all the confusion, all the doubt out of how God views different people in this world. Nobody can jump up and say, oh, we have exclusive rights to God because we are this group, we are that group. None of us do. 
we are all the same before God. Salvation of God is given the same way for each and every one of us. We should all be reminded of John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God is not the author of bias and racism. His salvation was given to the entire world. All people have access, regardless of what your background is, regardless of your political affiliation. God reached out for all of us. The idea of racial divisions does not work in the presence of God. The idea that we could be so radically opposed to one another because of different things, our politics, our, our the way we worship, one group is Baptist, one group is Episcopalian, none of that fits into the will of God. We are all called to be the same in His presence. Somebody should be reminded of 1 John 4 and 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? The idea of all people are the same in the presence of God should be magnified before all of us. Point number two, the command and parody. What Paul is dealing with is in addressing the self-righteous spirit. And until the church understands this concept, we will never effectively be able to reach out for the entirety of the world. Satan exploits division. He looks for cracks between congregations, between bodies of Christ, between believers and looks to exploit those divisions and when those divisions show up the world when they hear our testimony when they hear the things that are coming out of our mouths they tend not to believe us because one group is saying one thing one group is saying another thing and everybody is claiming at the same time to be Christians in this particular case within the Roman context the Gentile believers who outnumber the Jewish converts believe that they are better off than the Jews because we don't have the same uh, baggage essentially that the Jews have with the Mosaic Law. The Gentiles feel that they are not under the same condemnation because they don't have to deal with the same restrictions according to the law. But what Paul is clearly saying is that the Gentiles too will be judged not according to the standard of the, of the law but according to the standard of the Lord. We find that made manifest right there in Romans 2, 12, and 13. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So what we pick up right there, the first part of that verse where it says, for as many as have sinned without the law. They're not better. They're not worse. They're simply different. I've often said that you don't have the right to criticize anybody simply because they sin different than you do. All of us are sinners. Matter of fact, Paul will even later on argue that when we get into the third chapter with that famous passage that says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Gentiles are not being held to the same standard that the Jewish believers are because they were never put to that same standard. But that does not mean that they are exempt from dealing with the issues of sin simply because we're not under the law. They are not sinless, they are just simply to be judged by a different standard. So we have to understand that, again, this reinforces the idea that all people are the same in the eyes of God. 
On the other end of the spectrum, you have the Jews who are feeling somewhat smug because we have the laws of Moses. God made us a special people. We are a called out people. We're different from all of the Gentiles. And they believe that they have a different set of standards. Paul continued this idea with them where it says, and as many as have sinned, going to the later part of the verse, have sinned in the law, they will be judged by the law. So it's not a matter of what you know. It's not a matter of your background. It's really a matter of how you live, the things you choose to do as an individual. The Lord holds all people to be accountable for their own lives. What makes us equal in before God is how we live. It's not your race, it's not your affiliations, it's not your national origins. We are all the same and we're held to the standard of how we have chosen to live. Somebody needs to understand the idea for the hearers of the law are just or not the hearers of the law are just, but in fact the doers of the law. Many groups of people, especially even among modern day Christians, are ready to declare that they are better than somebody else's group. Baptist is better than Episcopalian. Catholics are better than Presbyterian. Everybody wants to claim that we have the one true gospel. And we forget the idea that God doesn't care about your affiliations. He doesn't care about our labels. He cares about how we live in accordance with the word. James 1 and 22 says, be doers of the word and not just hearers only. A lot of people pay very good lip service. A lot of people will say all the right things. But what holds us to the world is how we live. This is the reason, and this is going to come as a shock to a lot of people, this is one of the reasons that church attendance alone does not make you a good Christian. No matter how many times you come to service, no matter how many times you are there, to just simply say, well, I go to church every Sunday, that's wonderful. But the idea that you go to church is for the purpose of worship, which you are giving your glory unto God, but you're also there to learn how to live in the world once you walk outside of those doors. How many times you're there, how many days a week you're there, is meaningless if you don't put it into practice. How many Bibles you own is meaningless if you don't put the content of it into practice. So whether you are a Jew, or a Gentile, it's still an issue of how you live and less of an issue of your biology or, or your racial background or your political affiliation. Point number three in our outline, the conscience and parity. The conscience and parity. Now, this admonition is being directed primarily at those who are not under the Mosaic law. Picks up at verse 14. When the Gentiles, which have not the law. Gentiles were people who were not born of the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham. The law was given to the Jews, the children of Israel, those that Moses brought out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. These are the Jews, the children of Israel. All other people were considered to be Gentiles. Throughout the New Testament, they're oftentimes referred to as the Greeks. But the idea that Gentiles who are not Judaic, who are not Jews, just simply being a Gentile does not exempt you from judgment by God. So the idea that happens at verse 15 says, shows the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience. Again, though the Gentiles did not have the law, the Mosaic law to guide them in knowing right from wrong, they have their conscience. 
they have something that's working on within them that has always given them an idea, a compass to know the difference between right and wrong. All people, all cultures have an intrinsic set of values that exist within their own personal spirit. And this is what we've often referred to as having a good conscience. Your conscience is there to help guide you until you reach the point where you become aware of the presence of God. So the idea of just simply saying, well, I'm a good, I'm a moral person, I don't need God. Yes, you do, because your conscience should lead you to seek more. Your conscience should lead you to seek the presence of God. So what Paul is saying to the Gentiles here is, yes, your conscience has done wonderful things. It has led you, but that same conscience holds you accountable for your works, for your actions. Your conscience, picking up verse 15, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, accusing or else excusing one another. The conscience acts like the law in the fact that it is a witness to who you are regarding your character, regarding your conduct. Your conscience either accuses you or it exonerates you. Your conscience is not a perfect guide like the Word of God is. But it should be sufficient to make somebody realize that you are responsible for your conduct. A troubled conscience is a difficult thing to live with. It can make you toss and turn all night long. It can keep you up. It can make you start losing weight because you can't digest food right. It will condemn you as much as the law will condemn you. And therefore, a wise man should make good friends with his conscience. Point number four in the outline. The court for the parody. This court has a schedule. Verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men. Anytime you're going to a worldly court, there's a court date. Like it or not, every one of us, Christian, Jew, believer, non-believer, we have an ultimate court date. Divine judgment is on your schedule, whether you like it or not. We find that in Hebrews chapter 9, or verse 27, it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. It is the ultimate expression of anybody's life to prepare for judgment day. You live your life, you go through everything that you're going through, but you are preparing ultimately for judgment because you will be in that court. And within that court of judgment, there are some things that are going to happen. Again, at verse 16, it says, God shall judge secrets of men. Absolutely, positively nothing will be hidden in God's court. Now, this might come as a big shock for people who have spent their entire life trying to conceal all of the, the dirt, all of the dastardly things you've done in your life. You've hidden your evil from other people, from your spouse, from your children, from law enforcement. You've managed to duck and dodge from judges, from other courts, from people and other institutions. Many people haven't gotten away, they've just simply gotten by. God knows. Things will come out in the court of heaven that may not have ever been known by any man or any woman. And all people, again this goes back to the concept of parody, all people will be treated the same in God's court. The famous as well as the obscure. The rich man as well as the poor man. All secrets will be revealed. And when we say all secrets, that means all. The old saying, what we do in the dark is going to come to the light. 
all of your deepest and darkest secrets will be revealed and they will be dealt with in the presence of the Lord. For the believer, we ultimately know that we have the knowledge that our sins have been forgiven. Thank God for the blood of Christ. Every one of our sins is forgiven. But you still have to face the fact that all of your secrets will be brought to light. You may be forgiven, but it's all coming out. As they say, everything comes out in the wash. So that should make us mindful of the things that we do because the things that you do and get away with, somebody's still going to find out about them. The wonderful thing about this, this courtroom is we have an advocate in this court. We have a savior in this court. Again, the text says, God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Christ is the judge in this court. He will conduct this hearing. God has committed all judgment into his hands. You find that in John 5 and 22. It's going to be a rough judgment, especially for those who have mistreated Christ along this earthly journey. Many people have ignored Christ. Many people have pushed Christ to the back burner. People that have gotten saved, joined church, gave, allegedly gave Christ their life. You will still have to answer for the things that you've done to him. He is our advocate. He is ultimately our judge. The standards of this court are also contained right there within that same verse. God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. My gospel is the message of salvation that Paul has been proclaiming. Judgment according to the gospel means what we have done, what we have said, by our own actions before God. We will be judged by that gospel. That is the standard. That is the bar that all of us will have to reach. Now, you're saying, I have to reach it by your own will, by your own words. You cannot reach it. You cannot do it on your own. Your goodness, your greatness, your, your alms, your, your, your tithes, your offering, Nothing that you do by yourself will ever be enough. It is simply because of the grace of God, the blood of Jesus, which washes away our sins. That is what is our salvation in this court. Every person that will stand in that court will have to know whether or not they have truly accepted Christ as Savior and as Lord. We often talk about that, that all you have to do is confess and believe. But the fact of the matter is, nobody knows the level of your confession but you. You can say all the right things. I can say all the right things. Every individual, you can learn all of the cliches, all of the right things that are considered churchy, that are considered spiritual. But the idea is, you know, and God knows. These are the things that will ultimately come out in the judgment of God. Many people mock the gospel. Many people mock the church. Many people have rejected the gospel. But in the end, all will stand in the judgment by that gospel. And that gospel will determine their eternal destiny. The gospel is simply what the church has always proclaimed. It is the ultimate arbitrator of good and evil. The gospel is the good news that Jesus loved us enough that he died on that cross to bear the burden of our sins. Every person will ultimately decide where you're going to stand. The Lord presents us with choices. Choose this day, as, as to, to coin what Joshua said, choose this day whom you're going to serve. The choice is still a valid question. Regardless of how long you've been associated with church or around church, the gospel of Christ still saves and still cleanses. So it ultimately comes down to 
what are you doing? Not your neighbor, not your friend. What are you doing? Let us pray. Again, our Father, we thank you for this opportunity to call on your name. We thank you for the opportunity to delve into your word. Help us to understand the parody of your word, that you are judging all of us the same, that you are treating all of us the same, and that we would learn to allow our own spirit to treat every person the same way that you are going to treat us. Help us to become good stewards of your word, good stewards of this gospel, and that we would learn how to walk boldly in your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Again, I hope that this time has been a blessing to you. I thank God for every one of you who has joined with us as we strive to try and make this time of sharing a little bit better, a little bit more efficient, and help us to spread the word of God that we might gain a greater understanding and a greater meaning, and then not only just to understand it, but then to apply it to our lives. If this Bible study has been helpful to you, take a few moments, hit the like button, put something positive in the comments section, share the video with a neighbor, with a friend, we understand that the COVID-19 pandemic might be keeping us at home. It might keep us away from gatherings of the traditional sense, but we can still reach out for people in new and improved ways. We're able to reach people with this type of a format that we may have never been able to reach beforehand. We have people that we know are tuning in in other states outside of Illinois, and we are thankful that we are able to do that. We hope to be able to meet with every member of Zion Gate again soon, but until that time, continue to lift this church in prayer, continue to lift your pastor in prayer, and until we can all meet again together in the, as we say, the old time way, may the Lord bless and keep in each and every one of you. Thank you. God bless you.